In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Sam Ferris is back. It's been a minute. And since it's been a while, we have to get an update on some of Sam's favorite players in this 2023 draft. Stay tuned. Happy Friday and big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs, it helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to and faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And Mr. Draft Dummies himself, Sam Ferris, is here. Sam, it has been a while. Um, I know I've you know, there's holidays. I think you did some traveling. I did some traveling. And how's everything been? Happy New Year to you. It's, it's crazy that it's like January 20th and we're saying yes, Happy New Year. <laughs> to you too. Um, some of the people that know know that follow me, but I'm my job is I'm an accountant. And so um, I'm working like 60 hours a week right now. The first few weeks of January, it's like my busy season. Um, so that's like the main thing that I do. And so that's been taking up a lot of my time, but the, the basketball never stops. Uh, I still stay on top of it in the hours that I have, but that's kind of the main reason that I've uh, been a little bit more quiet over the last few weeks, but we're just wrapping up. So I'll have more time uh, after this week to get back fully into everything. Well, if you got to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is exactly. the bills. <laughs> you so, got to keep paying the bills. Yeah. Are, are you doing? Um, are you like a? Are you at like a a, a big five or no? Is it the, yeah, is it big, the big four? Yeah, I was yeah. about to say. You know what? <laughs> it's crazy. I used to work in recruiting interns for the really? the big four, but I was thinking, is it big four or big five? Then I was gonna say, is it power five? I was, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's been so long since I I've been in that world, but. If I thought hard about it, I could probably tell you to tell you the the big four accounting firms. But I, I just remember when I was recruiting these interns, everybody wanted to work for you know one of the big four firms. And then once they got the jobs, and maybe two or three years after graduation, they were like, "I have no life at the beginning of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me switch to a a smaller company." And then they said they they traveled a lot, and and I mean I've heard it's just a a very it, it can be a very demanding job at this time of year so big thanks to you for taking time to to do the podcast because like you said you got to keep the main thing the main thing and the main thing is the accounting which pays the bills yeah. all right so it's been quite a bit of time has passed we're now maybe a little bit past the halfway point some guys that are i started off hot i've cooled off some guys are trending in the right direction and I just wanted to get your take on guys that have stood out to you that are either climbing up your big board or you already had them high, but guys that just have caught your attention over the last few few weeks. Yeah, so I put together a list of four or five guys, and I didn't even think about like a theme or even think about this as I was going through and selecting these guys, but all of the guys that I picked are wings. And I think when I when I look at that group, to me, I think one of the strengths of this draft class is shooting on the wing. And Brandon Miller is one of those guys. I know you've talked a lot about him recently and uh, a lot of threads on, on Twitter about that. But other mm -hmm. guys that I listed, Grady Dick, uh, Brandon Miller, Jet Howard, Bryce Sensabaugh, they're, that to me is one of the strengths of the, this draft class. And I think NBA teams all need wings who can shoot. So it's it's a valuable position and player type. And I think it's one of the strengths of this class. Um, so out of the guys I mentioned, we kind of mentioned it before. Anyone in particular that you wanted to start with? Yeah, you know, let's talk about Brandon Miller. I guess I haven't discussed it this week. So um, okay. <laughs> got to do the weekly discussion then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think it was like late Saturday night. Um, he had, a, he had a good game and I must've retweeted somebody's highlight. And then Tyrese yeah. Rice, shout out to Tyrese Rice, had a great career in Europe. He had commented that he could end up number two with the right team or yeah. something like that. 
and I made the comment Detroit doesn't need him. I stand by that. I just and I get the whole theory of you got to draft the best player available. I just it doesn't make sense for Detroit to draft Scoot Henderson to me. But I get it. But I was basically saying how much I like Brandon Miller. And I felt like people were nitpicking. And I guess it just turned into like a 24 hour thread. Yeah. And um I guess they changed how how Twitter is. So I can't really see it, but I didn't see the negative stuff. But I just got a bunch of DMs of people like, hey, draft Twitter can be a little bit aggressive. <laughs> I apologize for draft Twitter was I mean, I got like I mean, I got messages from some pretty high ranking people in the draft community and people from NBA teams and agents were just like, so I didn't see it. Like, I don't, I didn't see anybody say anything crazy about me and people who are sending me like different screenshots, but apparently I must've missed some stuff because the way people who are apologizing for draft Twitter, but I, I stand by it. And I think in, in this field, um, a lot of people are just kind of following the crowd and I've, I've mentioned it to you before. I've always respected how you do not follow yeah. the crowd, you know, and I'm sure um, you probably got some hate on it for not having yeah. Keegan Murray as, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I just think a lot of people are following the crowd. A lot of people are afraid to be wrong. And I, and I've been guilty of that too. There were times where I can name plenty of drafts where there was a guy that I just didn't see it, but I'm like, the consensus says it. So if I have this guy who I, he's 20 on my board, but he's going to end up going six, I guess I should put him at seven. And then I look back and I'm like, Hey, you know what? I was right about this guy. He can't do this. So anyway, long story short, I like Brandon Miller. I do think the gap is closing between him and Scoot. Scoot is still number two on my board. But I don't think that – I mean, obviously, there's no guarantees in the draft. But I do think you can end up drafting for fit over best player available and still end up getting the best player in the long run. And yeah. That's highly possible. But that's enough about my, my thoughts. What are your thoughts on Brandon Miller? What's funny, uh, uh, a lot of things that I wanted to say, but the last point you made about fit versus BPA – like I've always been just to take best player available, but more and more as I gain experience and watch real life scenarios play out is fit matters a lot. It really does. You see guys and some of it is just not, is just avoiding ending up in bad situations where look, I, I've loved a lot of the guys that the Rockets have picked, but we've seen a lot of stuff come out in the media. And if you just watch them play, the fit sucks. The fit sucks, and they're just trying to develop like 12, 13 young guys at a time with no vets. This is another thing you've talked about that I wholeheartedly agree with. You have to have vets to set the table and provide the example, and that's something that I've learned and come to appreciate more is, yeah, best player available matters, but the situation matters a ton unless you're like a superstar player that's just not going to miss. Um, but And then the, my take on the Brandon Miller thing is that I – I love people going out of their way and making their own decisions, not just following the herd. The thing I would say is for me, I clearly have scoot number two. Now, if Detroit ended up at number two and they, and they feel secure with Cade and Ivy, I would just say, we'll just take scoot because I think league wide, he's got more value and then you can trade him. And to me, like, it's still a value play. So that's the way that I would kind of answer that question. But Brandon Miller is a prospect. I had him ranked in the lottery coming in. So I was kind of in early on him. But still, even compared to, I think I had him 12 or 13 coming into the year, he still exceeded my expectations because I knew he was a shooter with size. And I liked the one dribble, two dribble pull-ups and the three-point shot. Which we haven't, seen. we haven't seen. We haven't seen it. even mm -hmm. seen because yeah. at Alabama, it's it's all about pace and three point shooting, yep. which I I agree with. So I think he's got more of that to his game, but just the all around scoring uh, has been better than I expected. Like every other game now, he's scoring twenty five to thirty points. I will note, just as Des Devil's Advocate, that Alabama plays at a faster pace. They they get up and down. They kind of run an NBA system. So you could argue that. His stats are inflated somewhat, but even taking that into account, the raw numbers he's putting up in scoring have been really impressive. So I've had 
I felt like I, I need to move him up from late lottery where I have him. I can't quite get to the top three discussion, but I'm open to it happening. Um, I'm not there yet. I still, I know there's been the Jabari Smith comps and I don't like those comps. <laughs> and yeah, they're, they're not one-to-one -one comps. I actually wrote down a few stats as well, because I thought it was interesting that people talk about the lack of like off the bounce game for Jabari Smith. He's kind of stiff and people say the same thing about Brandon Miller. And I agree to an extent, but if you look at the numbers in college, Jabari Smith only shot 43% on twos for like a 6'10", 6'11 guy. Brandon Miller's up like over 47%. So clearly better there. And then you look at dunks, which is just kind of an indicator of athleticism. And Brandon Miller already has 11 compared to the 14 for Jabari Smith last year. So those are just a couple metrics I look at where Brandon Miller is kind of at a different level I think I, I don't think he has the same limitations. He is a little bit shorter, but I, the point is, I think it's a little bit of a lazy comparison just because people make the comp because Jabari Smith was so recent last year and we're all watching and thinking about him, but I, I don't think that's really the best comp out there. No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't either, <laughs> which is weird because I was not the biggest Jabari guy. I was a huge Palo guy, but I'm a huge Brandon Miller guy. Yeah. And so I just don't see the cap. All right. When we return, we'll definitely have to get into some more of the wings, maybe a little bit more about, about Brandon Miller, but let's talk about LinkedIn. If you are a small business, you are looking to hire the right candidates, then you have to go to LinkedIn jobs because LinkedIn jobs can hire, can help you hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with the people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with their targeting tools. They go beyond the resume data by using insights from your job posts, your company, and their 875 million member profiles. 875 million member profiles. That's, I don't even think the United States has 875 million people. But you put your job in front of the most qualified candidates, identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs, and you can connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn Jobs, it makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your qualifications, and it's all in one platform. It is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. And LinkedIn Jobs, it helps you find the qualified candidates you want to and what you want to talk to and helps you find them faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free in terms and conditions apply. All right. Once again, you are listening to the locked on NBA big board podcast. And I got my guy, Mr. Draft Dummies here. We're talking about wings. We spent the whole first segment talking about accounting and Brandon Miller. And let's let's talk about another wing that has caught your attention. And I don't know if he's rising up your board or if he's where you thought he would be, but someone that you're pretty high on. All right, let's do Jet Howard next. Um, another guy, I didn't have him lottery, but I remember I saw a graphic coming into the season that said it listed the top colleges that had – sent the most guys to the NBA that weren't five stars. So like uh, lower recruited guys that weren't expected to be one and dones, but ended up making it to the NBA in Michigan was number one on that list, which I thought was interesting. And at the time I tweeted out that I predicted Jet Howard would be that next guy, but similar in a similar vein to Brandon Miller, he's just exceeded my expectations as a scorer, putting up raw numbers, scoring 30 points, uh, in a game or two this year, often in the 20s. And look, I thought he was going to be efficient in his role shooting with size, but I didn't see those big scoring numbers coming this early for him. And so he's even exceeded my expectations. Where where have you been on Jet Howard this year? Yeah, first of all, the Michigan thing, I mean, just Jordan Poole, Karis LeVert. Uh... The Wagner's. The Wagners. There's somebody else that's missing. I can't think of it. Oh, was it Tim Hardaway Jr.? Tim Hardaway Jr., yep. Was it Trey Burke? Trey Burke also. Yeah, so that's a, a pretty good track record. And I feel like Ohio State is 
well, at least the last two drafts are gonna you can be able to say the same thing for Ohio State. Um, I like Jet. I mean, I like the size. I, I don't like the fact that he averages less than three rebounds a game. I do not yeah. like that at all. But here's a question I have for you. And I, I was having a hard time explaining it to I don't even remember the person I was talking to on Twitter, but they were in my DMs. And I was trying to explain to them why Jet Howard is better than Imani Bates. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And so he was talking about the, the game at the beginning of the year. I think Imani had like 36. He's like 12 of 19 on the floor. And he was like, why is Jet Howard so much better or, or highly rated than, than Imani Bates? So I gave him my answer. So now I want you to give <laughs> your answer. Because there's a lot of people yeah. on – it's like – Imani Bates is one of those guys that people are divided on too. There are people who think like everybody's hating on him and he should be a first round pick because he's a bucket. He's 6'10. He can score. Then there's people that are just like, dude, his team is forward 14. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> what are your thoughts on Imani Bates and Jet Howard? Shout out to, I forgot the person's name. Sorry. Who, who asked me this question? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the, there's a couple reasons. One of them is because uh, I think we're more comfortable saying that Jet Howard can fit into a role that he doesn't need the ball in his hands, that he's not going to be taking crazy off the bounce shots. Like he'll run off screens. He'll hit catch and shoot. He knows how to play within a system. Like he doesn't need to be the guy that's given the ball to produce. He can find ways to produce off the ball. Uh, So I think that's one reason. The second reason is I think, that Jet Howard is an underrated passer. And that's one of the things that has surprised me in a positive fashion with him this year. Uh, You look at the numbers, 16% assist rate, and also doesn't turn the ball over like at all either. So that's been, to me, his passing has been the facet of his game that's surprised me in a positive manner the most. And also I kind of just think that people or maybe executives or scouts might have just a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth um, regarding Bates, just the production and kind of the decline of his stock over the last few years. So it might take him some time to kind of rebuild his stock in their eyes. Uh, That's just from my perspective. But in terms of the on the court fit, I think it's, we know he can fit in a role based on what we saw from Jet Howard pre-college and also fitting in on a really good team in college. And also just the shooting size passing package, I think people feel a little bit more safe with, or at least that's my perspective. And so that's kind of the answer I would give, but it's an interesting question that I had not posed myself before you uh, asked it. Yeah, I've been getting it a whole lot to the point where people are just like, why is everybody hating on Imani Bates? And then if you bring up the record, they're like, well, I mean, his team isn't good. That's not his fault. That's why he has to shoot so many tough shots. It's it's one of those things you can go down a rabbit hole and get into this crazy discussion and nobody's mind is going to change. All right, who is next? We've talked about Brandon Miller. We've talked about Jet Howard. Who is another wing that has really caught your attention this year? So another sweet shooting wing is Grady Dick. And look, he it, it's not like he's just really come on the scene and been awesome lately. It's just the consistency all year from him. And I, I was a little bit lower on him. I, I viewed him more as kind of a late first round guy, but he just keeps doing it at a, at a high level. And, and the thing is that I thought was interesting is I've kind of been a little bit uh, worried about him defensively at the next level. And this week I was kind of doing some research on him and I looked at, at his two closest statistical comps, if you just look at a statistical comparison, the two closest guys to him are Devin Vassell and Gary Harris, who two very good defensive prospects and are good defenders in the NBA. So that was kind of interesting to me. That gives me a little bit more hope that now he's not going to be that level, but if his closest statistical comps are that maybe he's a little bit better defensively than I'm giving him credit for. And so that was kind of interesting to me, but the guy that I actually compare him to a little, not a one for one thing, but another guy that was close statistically to him is Tyler Hero, where if he can, this is like a high end outcome because Tyler Hero is a really good NBA player. But if we're looking at 
kind of like a template for an offensive game for him at the NBA level. Like maybe if he hits a higher end outcome, I kind of like that for him. But uh, what uh, what have your thoughts been on, on Grady Dick? Were you high on him coming into the season? Yeah, I mean, I thought that. I mean, he had the positional size and he could shoot. And yeah. there's always going to be a need for that. The Tyler Hero comparisons, I don't think he has as much juice off the dribble as, as Tyler yeah. Hero. The Devin Vassell one and, and Gary Harris is interesting because... But Tyler Hero didn't show too much juice. Again, it was Kentucky. Kentucky, Kentucky yeah, kind of hold, holds everyone back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's why Touché. it's like, shoot, <laughs> should we put uh, Casey Wallace in the top five? <laughs> I know, we, don't know, we don't know what he could do. Yeah. Um, Here's a question for you, uh, mm-hmm. but I answer your question. I did like I did like Grady Dick. What is the biggest difference between Grady Dick and Tucker DeVries? Ooh, I like Tucker DeVries. That's a good question. They're both white. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's that's a similarity. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, and maybe honestly, that's why I'm lower on him defensively, just kind of based on that bias. No, I like Tucker DeVries. <laughs> maybe it's kind of some of the uh, mid-major bias against him. I don't know. Well, I guess you have to start with that coming into college that Grady Dick has always been viewed as like a top 10, top 15 player, McDonald's All-American. Like he was expected to be a one and done. And he's done it right away for like Kansas team. That's one of the best teams in the country. As a freshman, he very rarely has a couple bad games in a row like i said the consistency over the whole year has been awesome and it's taken devries a little bit to get going so he's a little bit older um but i i'm with you i like devries as like a flyer in the second round i think he's just a little bit worse coming in and i think you have to take into account uh, a little bit of the pre-draft sample which is pre-college sample excuse me which is that greedy dick is always been viewed as that level of player then the question gets into how much do you value that pre-college sample which is something that you and i have discussed a few times um so are are you high on devries or are you kind of playing devil's advocate with that Uh, i'm high on him i i was just asking because i'm on like my second round of watching film so you know like you do your first round i'm like kind of on my second round and so i'm i just literally watched his film before we got on and I was like, man, the the shooting is there. The release is quick. The confident. Um, I mean, not fast, not able to like beat guys off the dribble. But I do like the fact that if there is a smaller guy on him, he will, you know, try to run through him. And he will try to take him to the post and shoot a turnaround. So I, I, I like him. All right. When we return, got to talk about a few more guys that, that are on Sam's list as some of the, the best wings in this class. But if you're looking to eat healthy, then you need to listen to this message about Built Bar. Because if you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and the calories, then Built Bar is for you. I know it's the beginning of the year and a lot of people want to change their eating habits, but you want to eat something that is healthy and actually tasty. And that's where Built Bar comes in. And the reason why they're tasty and healthy for you is because they're 100% real chocolate. And they have only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. They come in some good flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. And what makes Built Bars even more cool now is that, well, I mean, I guess they always been cool. But what makes the situation a little bit different in 2023 is you can actually go get a Built Bar at Walmart. So you used to have to order them at Built.com, but now you can go to your local Walmart or even Sam's Club. So if you go to Walmart, you just go to the pharmacy section and you can grab a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four box of cookies and cream, double chocolate or coconut puffs. And if you're a big dog and that's not enough, you need to go to Sam's, then you can go grab a 13 bar box with brownie, batter, churro. You can thank me later. But if you want to order them, you can order them at built.com. All right, last segment. And we need to find out who is next. Who's the next wing that Sam is high on? Let's do Bryce Sensabaugh. So he's he's a little bit more, you know, two guard, I guess, than wing. But what I thought was interesting with him is I think when you think of Bryce Sensabaugh, you think of scorer, you think of bucket getter, and he is that. 
46 percent from three <laughs> but exactly yeah. you don't think of it you think of him more as scorer than shooter but then you look at the numbers 46 percent from three 82 percent on free throws and also almost 50 percent on long twos so the dude is just a scorer and a shooter and i wanted to bring up because we've talked about comps for a few of these different guys you know, uh, over the last few drafts, when you think about kind of like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six scores that have gone top 15 or top 20, Moses Moody and Malachi Branham are guys that I've seen other people compare him to. And I think that's fair because it's similar player type. But those guys had more severe athletic limitations, I think, than Bryce Sensabaugh does. So I, I like him better at this point. I think... Sensabaugh is a little undervalued. I'm not sure exactly where the public or consensus is, but I'd have him in my lottery right now just because that combination of shooting and scoring is so hard to find. He's already one of the best scorers in college basketball. And so I, I really like him a lot. I think he might be a little bit undervalued, but I'm not exactly sure. I've seen him in different places. I've seen him as late as kind of the first round and others have him late lottery where I have him. He's a guy that I just think people did not have a bunch of information on coming into the season. Yeah. And I think that there is a lot of Slow to bias off their yeah, towards your, your your first big board. Yeah, I, He popped to me right away. Like, yeah. it took one game and, mm-hmm. and he popped. And then I think that, I mean, even though I, I like his frame, I do think that around draft time, you're going to start seeing Bryce Sensabaugh is down to 220. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna start seeing like these clips of him even being more athletic and his stock is gonna skyrocket around draft time so I, I think that he's gonna be like the late riser that we end up talking about a whole lot in may and june talking about hey the, <laughs> the rumors are that he's he's killing it on the workout scene because i mean he is the he has the type of body and the type of skill set in the in the game that i think will either dominate the workout circuit or agents are going to run from him in the workout yeah. circuit. <laughs> that was that was going to be my next point is I agree with that. I hadn't thought about that. Him being the late riser because I could see him going into one-on-one, three-on-three workouts and just killing guys with his ability to score. I don't think guys are going to be able to stop him. So uh and not even and not even necessarily in like one on zero, but if he gets in a workout with other guys like you're saying might be a guy that agents try to avoid matchups with so that's kind of always interesting behind the scenes but i agree with that i think uh he might continue to rise uh over the next few months but if not i could see him certainly being that guy between the end of season and the draft but he's already there for me as like a late lottery guy and every day you look at the box score and you pull up the numbers and watch his possessions and he's putting up 20 points, uh, getting to his spots wherever he wants to get to. And then a couple, every couple games, he has these big time dunks that really surprise you as well. So I really like his game and I think he's a little bit undervalued. Yep. I'm telling you, man, <laughs> once you start seeing the reports, he's lost 10 to 15 yep. pounds and then you're going to see the, the, the dunks. Like he's already athletic. Yep. So he, I am and that's the thing about being an agent. Like I always try to think of things from the perspective of an agent, from the perspective of a general manager. And if I'm an agent, and I, I, I had episodes where I talked about this last year, if I'm an agent and my player who is, you know, 19 years old and he is has an undeveloped body, and if I see Bryce Sensenball on that, that workout, hey, you know what? We can't make it today (laughs) because I mean, I've heard stories about some of these workouts are brutal. And so I've heard stories, guys, and they had to play one-on-one full court. I've heard stories where they just wanted to, you're not going to beat him in a one-on-one situation. He's too strong. There's no sync defense. There's no help defense. (laughs) He can shoot. So he might outshoot you in a shooting drill and then he might beat you one-on-one. So you, I mean, you're not going to look good against him. All right. Now, here's a player that I want to get your opinion on. 
and it is he's like a jumbo wing, not necessarily a shooter. Like the guys that you've <laughs> talked about today yeah. are all shooters. This guy, mm-hmm. the shooting is the swing skill. What are your thoughts on Leonard Miller? Yeah, my my take with him is that it's just weird to me because if you remember on draft Twitter before last year's draft, uh, everyone was talking about him and everyone was excited about him because he was kind of like the mystery box that nobody really knew too much about, but he was like a big wing. Uh, But then you kind of saw him play in the scrimmages and he was still pretty raw and underdeveloped and, and needed more time and more seasoning to work on his game. And now uh, like a year later, eight months later, whatever, like I don't really see anybody talk about him that much anymore. So it's kind of fun to see or interesting to see that dichotomy because if you watch the Ignite games, like he's been good and he's actually putting up numbers in the G League now where I've got his numbers. He's averaging over 15 points, eight like rebounds. Eight rebounds, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's huge too. I've seen him play in person multiple times. He's legit like 6'10". He's really, really big. And then in the games when Scoot didn't play or somebody didn't play, like he would step up and score like 20 points per game and he's putting up numbers. So it's just interesting to me that when he was kind of that mystery box, like before the draft, like a year ago, everyone was so enamored. But now that he's actually putting up numbers, I don't know if it's because he's playing in the G League and he's kind of overshadowed maybe by Scoot and by the college guys. But he's a legit jumbo wing, and my main question with him is, I just don't know how good his touch is or how much that's going to improve. And you mentioned that leading into this is the jumper is the swing skill, unlike the rest of these wings. But the size and the scoring ability is really intriguing. And I've thought ever since I've seen him play in person that when scouts – see him and later on in this process again similar to sensible when they see just his size like he's a guy that's going to look really good in one-on-zero workouts uh, apart from maybe the standstill shooting aspect but just seeing his frame like it's hard for me to envision him not going top 20. he's just got the frame that people look for in the draft and so that's kind of my take is it's just weird that nobody's talking about him right now And, and i think people should be more than they are yeah, I agree. I'm going to have to steal that that, that quote from you and put it on Twitter because you're exactly right. When nobody knew about him and when the only film you could get was that film, and he, let me know if you've seen it. Like the first film that I saw on him was like he was in like this YMCA looking gym mm-hmm. with the big glass in the background. And you could see like the people walking into the gym. Yeah. And then uh, so, I mean, the film wasn't great. And it's like everybody liked him. Like you're 100 percent right. And, and what's weird about it is is that he has been productive. And if you use the G League as a, if you use the the G League and say, hey, the guys are playing against grown men, I'm going to give Scoot the bump over anybody close to him because he's playing against grown men. But Leonard Miller hasn't been getting that same bump uh-uh. because he's, I mean, he's been productive. It's like 15, 8. I mean, to me, this is the skill set, other than the shooting, the, the skill set that I like most about him is the potential as a passer. He's one of these weird guys that you see potential as a passer, but he's not a good decision maker yet. And if he yeah. can cut down on the turnovers, I think he has the vision to be like an effective ball mover, a guy that down the line, he could, you know, end of the shot clock, he can put him in ball screens and he can make a play. So I'm I'm high on his upside. He's still young. Again, that size, he's 6'10. Actually, I've I've stood by him in um in Vegas. Yeah. And he, he still has like this child like innocence to his game. Yeah. He's still like nice. And then another thing that stood out to me, and I've talked about it before, was he had a, a play in a game where he hit a game winning shot. And I like that. I like the fact that he wasn't scared. He he caught the ball on the inbounds, dribbled the length of the court pulled up at the free throw line, hit a game winning shot. And that just, I mean, it just showed like a, a, just the mindset of being clutch and not afraid of the moment that I really liked. Yep. Yeah. And then one final point is this got me thinking, Jonathan Kaminga played for the ignite a few years ago, similar player type, like power wings. They averaged the same amount of 
points, but Leonard Miller has been much more efficient than Kaminga was. And so like Kaminga ended up what going seventh, I think. Um, but yeah. it's just, that's kind of to put it in perspective a little bit that he he's putting up legit numbers on decent efficiency outside of the three point shooting plus a ton of rebounds. And so, yeah, like he's not getting this bump in terms of production against other G league players that I think guys like Kaminga, Scoot Henderson, Jalen Green have gotten. And so I think there there's just a little bit of a missing link there. And I think because of that, he might be undervalued now. And I'll be interested to see where he is in the eyes of the public and the consensus uh, a couple months from now. Yeah, I agree. The G League, this is what, year three? And last year was weird. Like, their leading score went, like, 37th. Dyson Daniels went, what, 7th or 8th. Um, the year before, Knicks didn't get drafted, but he's played. And he's, he's been a roster. He's on a roster. So there's kind of like an inconsistency. I think uh, Michael Foster was really productive on paper last year. It's a style thing with him, but I don't know. I guess it's going to take a, a few years before we get like consistency from the draft branch of the G League. Well, that wraps up this episode. Thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, you have to check out the Game to Game NBA podcast. Every moment, every performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. So follow the Game to Game podcast on the Locked On NBA channel. It is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, this is Rafael Barlow with Sam Ferris, Mr. Draft Dummies himself, and we are out.